Good evening to each and every one of you here and to those of you who are watching on the in-house television. We're just so glad that you could be here this evening. Our upcoming announcements, there will be a Vesper service on Sunday, May the 15th, and that is going to be led by Deacon Dave Lucchese. And again, you can see that on Comcast Channel 991 or live stream. The next regularly scheduled worship service will be May the 21st, and that is going to be led by uh, Reverend Drew uh, Tuberville. It may be viewed on, on your channel 991 or live stream. Services for the Germantown Church of Christ will be held in the multipurpose room each Sunday at 2 p.m. Uh, Chaplain Spink provides man to man, that is a Bible study for men only, at 9 a.m. on Tuesdays in the card room. And Chaplain Spink also provides a Bible study at 11 a.m. on Thursdays in the auditorium. And again, it may be viewed on Comcast Channel 991 or live stream. Thank you. Maybe I could make just a quick comment about that Bible study on Thursdays. Uh, because of my schedule for the next couple of weeks, we are going to be doing the Bible study on Monday at 11. So, not Thursday. Uh, so, the next two weeks will be on Monday. So, just if uh, you're participating in that or watching it on live stream, you'll find us on Monday, but not on Thursday. And I also do want to let you know, assure you, that I realize that the Grizzlies are playing tonight. So when I get to preach, I'm going to talk as fast as I can. I'm going to be one of those commercial ads that you've heard, that, you know, where you can't understand anything. So, you know, we'll be out of here before you can, you know, you can get comfortable. So my guess is some of you are here thinking it'll bring the Grizz good luck for you to come to the worship service, right? Yeah, yeah I, know, I know you. I know you. Yeah. Anyway, welcome and... Uh, what a privilege it is to worship the Lord together. And our call to worship comes from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Okay, that psalm says we are the sheep of his hand. It reminds us of the Lord's, uh, the 23rd psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. And that particular psalm has been put to music in a lot of different ways. And this is a particular uh, tune to that 23rd psalm. Let us sing together, the Lord's my shepherd. Yet will I fear none here. 
Let's pray. Lord, we praise you. You're our creator and our king. We thank you so much for your love through Christ. Today, wrap us in your truth and teach us by your messenger. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first scripture is from John chapter 10, verse 11, and then 27 through 30. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The sing of our good shepherd using two verses of the hymn Savior like a shepherd lead us. Blessed Jesus, hear us when we pray. We have sung that, now we get to pray. And we have the privilege of coming to God's throne of grace to pray to Him concerning the needs of our hearts and the needs of the village community. You'll find on page 6 a list of our prayer requests, and I'm sure you have your own that you would want to add to this list. We have had this week the uh, National Day of Prayer, and we want to continue to be praying for our country and certainly for the situations around the world, especially in Ukraine. So we have much to pray about tonight. But we do want to remember the residents of our health care center, Jean Aronson, Henry Cray, Cicely Dermeyer, Kathy and Paul Funk, Bob and Sarah Green, Melinda Harris, Ada Johnston, Beverly Little, John Malish, Dr. P.D. Miller, Dan Norton, Dr. Scott Owens, Harriet Reed, Vivian Seeley, Kimberly Tucker, Janie Van Horn, Dick and Shirley Vosberg, Erwin Westmoreland, Nancy Williams, and the families of Vonetta Henton and Gigi Osborne. Well, let's look to our Lord in prayer. Father, we do count it a great privilege to bow together as one body and to seek your face and to uh, cast our burdens upon you. You have told us to be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, to make our requests known to you. You have promised that the peace of God that passes all understanding would guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We confess tonight that we are easily anxious, often anxious, and perhaps even now anxious. And so we pray for forgiveness for that and 
ask that you would grant us your peace and that you would give us confidence that if we cast our burdens upon you, that you care for us and that you will act in accordance with your will. We pray as the Lord Jesus taught us to pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, even in our own lives. And so, Father, we pray for these, the needs of the village, those that have been stated. We pray for those folks and for their particular needs and situations, for their families, for patience, for endurance, for healing, for hope and encouragement. Father, we pray that you would raise up those who are bowed down and laid aside. Father, we pray for our village community. We pray for those who, who labor here and serve us. We thank you for them and ask that you would renew their strength as they continue their work among us. And we pray for those who lead us and um, kind of set the pace and set the tone for the village and ask that you would grant them good wisdom and discernment and uh, good judgment in the decisions that they make. Father, we do pray that you would bless our families as we have Mother's Day this weekend. We thank you for the families from which we have come, for the influence of mothers who have loved us well. And we pray, Father, for your continued blessing upon our families and for the generations to come. Father, we pray for our nation as we have uh, bowed in prayer this week for our nation. We continue to pray that you would be with those in positions of authority, those that were in the executive branch and those in the legislative branch and those in the judicial branch. We pray for state leaders and governors and for local leaders and mayors and all of those that serve us. We pray for your blessing upon them. We ask that you would bring grace to our country and turn us away from the way that we seem to be going in order that we might bring glory and honor to you. And certainly our hearts grieve for the nations of the world and especially the land of Ukraine and the people there, many of whom have become refugees, many of whom have grieved, suffered the loss of family members. We pray, Father, for peace in that region. We pray that you would uh, restrain the, the Russian efforts to uh, make war in Ukraine, and we would pray, Lord, that you would uh, intervene in that uh, situation to bring some healing and some peace, give endurance to those who are in difficulty tonight. Father, we trust these situations to you. We feel helpless to know how to uh, change uh, the situations around the world, but we know that you're, nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is impossible for you. And so we cast our hopes and our confidence in you alone. And we pray these things tonight in the name of Jesus. Amen. So let us sing together, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. at this time.
And our next reading is from Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. And salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove, reprove and discipline. So be jealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And these are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Virginia. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this interesting letter that we find in the book of Revelation. We pray that it might speak to our hearts tonight and that we might uh, profit from considering its content and that we might hear it addressed to us, not just to the Laodiceans of another day and another time. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You've probably heard the name Peter Marshall. Peter Marshall, uh, I think, was the chaplain of the Senate for many, many years and a great author. And, um, he used to tell the story about a, a quiet little forest dweller who lived above, in the Alps above an Austrian village. You know, the village was a tourist trap. It was a tourist center. And uh, the town council hired this uh, hermit uh, somewhere up in the hills to clear the springs of debris and make sure that the waters that f flowed down to the city were clean and pure. And uh, as long as that was going on, th things were just going marvelously and the city became quite the tourist destination and uh, things were going very well until the city kind of met on hard economic terms and the town council got together and they thought, you know, uh, we're paying this guy somewhere up there to do something. We don't ever see him. He's out of sight, out of mind, you know. Maybe it's not necessary for us to have that expense. Maybe that's one area we could eliminate. And so the town council fired him. And for the first few weeks, nothing much changed except then the, the, uh, the spring started to bring water down into the city that was a little bit dingy and smelly and the tourists noticed and they started going other places and the commerce of the city kind of uh, ground to a halt and the, the city council got together and they said what are we going to do to reverse this and they said well what did we do what what changes oh we 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 fired our little hermit friend up in the mountains and somebody said, well, let's, let's get him back on the job and get things turned around. And so they did. And it did. Now, Peter Marshall tells that story to emphasize the fact that sometimes things that are not so obvious are very, very important. Uh, what in the Bible is described as the heart uh, that things that are hidden to many people are really of significant importance. 
you know, it's easy for us to spend most of our attention on our appearance to other people. I'm sure you took at least a couple of minutes uh, to get yourself together to come down here tonight because you wanted to present uh, an appropriate appearance. You didn't just roll out of bed in the morning and, and come down here looking like that. No. We often forget that the scripture talks about the hidden part of our lives as the heart. It, the, the scripture says, God does not look as man looks, for man looks at the outward appearance. And I can see all of you. I can see all of your outward appearance tonight. But God looks at the heart. And so he that we cannot see is looking upon us tonight, and he's not noticing whether your outfit matches or whether it's uh, current or old-fashioned. He's looking at our hearts. And you remember Jesus had a lot to say about that. He condemned the Pharisees because they did what? They cleaned the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they were full of greed and self-indulgence. On another occasion, Jesus said, you worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. How many times have you gone to church and you've gone through the ritual of the worship, but your heart was somewhere else? I'm guilty myself. It would be like a man who was meticulous in the care of his expensive automobile. Now, we all have had a neighbor like this, right? Wash and wax and wash and wax and wash and wax all the time. That was his pride and joy. But it would be crazy for somebody to put that kind of attention to the outside of the vehicle, but never raise the hood and never change the oil. He would pay the consequences for that neglect, wouldn't he? Well, tonight I want us to look at this passage in Revelation 3 because I think it speaks to the hidden part of us tonight. And we need to consider that. The author of this letter is the Lord Jesus himself. That's clear. And we're privileged to read it and to receive it. And we ask the question, well, why, why has Jesus written this? And my answer would be, Jesus is concerned that there is a significant difference between what the Laodiceans thought was true and what was really true, or what I call in, in the sermon title a false diagnosis. Now, have any of you ever been through that? Any of you ever? You probably haven't, I'm sure, but maybe one or two of you have been to a doctor and you've gotten a particular diagnosis and later on you found out that that diagnosis really wasn't exactly accurate and it kind of shifts into something else and you kind of bounce around in treatment and it can be very unsettling, right? If you think something but then find out it's something else. Well, what's the false diagnosis in this passage? The Laodiceans believed that everything was just fine. If you walked up to Mr. Laodicean and said tonight, how you doing? He'd say, fine. Listen to what he says, verse 17. I'm rich. I've prospered. I need nothing. His answer reeks of self-confidence and self-reliance and self-assurance. And that's the perspective that many of us have in our culture and in our church, that everything is okay we're headed on our way to heaven. Don't bother me with your questions or ideas or concerns. I'm all right in God's sight. I've not made any major mistakes. They're comparing themselves to other people. They may be blind to their own faults. It sounds a lot like the Pharisee headed to the temple to pray in Luke's gospel who says, I thank you that I'm not like other men. I thank you I'm not like him and him and her. Have you ever thought of that? You know, I, I'm, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need a thing. But notice Jesus wanted to warn these people that they had a misdiagnosis. They were in danger. They were not in good health. Verse 17 says, But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. 
That's a completely different diagnosis than what they had said. The patient is saying, I feel fine. But the doctor is saying the MRI doesn't lie. The CAT scan doesn't lie. Here it is. Now, what was the problem? Verse 15 says, Jesus says, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, what's their condition? Jesus' assessment, Jesus' diagnosis is that the Laodiceans were generally lukewarm, half-hearted. They weren't totally hostile to the things of the truth, but neither were they devoted to them. They did a lot of the right things. For the wrong reasons. They were in it for what's in it for them. They love people who could love them back. If they didn't have anything to give me back, why bother with them? A lot of them were just going through the motions. They were very mechanical in their worship. They didn't love God with their whole heart. Some years ago I saw this... uh, printed in a description. I would like to buy $3 worth of God. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep. Just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of God to make me love another person or pick beets with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I'd like to buy $3 worth of God, please. I wonder how many of you are are satisfied with $3 worth, $5, $10, $20 worth. In Jeremiah, God says, My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they've dug cisterns that can hold no water. They've rejected the true source of life and they're trying to find life somewhere else and it's not working. So what's Jesus say? He says, because you're lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. That sounds kind of crude, doesn't it? My mama and daddy wouldn't have wanted me to say those words. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. But that gives us some impression of of how serious Jesus is about this. They faced a dangerous consequence. And the Bible's frequently talking about that danger. It says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end of that way is death. Jesus said, wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many, many enter by it. There are words of warning all through the Scripture about this misdiagnosis. I've, about almost 50 years ago, I had to have the obligatory premarital physical. You ever have to have one of those? You, you know, I don't know that I would have, you know, proposed if I knew I had to go get a physical. Uh, and I had played sports all my life, and I had no medical issues, and I went, and I thought, boy, this is going to be a piece of cake. It wasn't a piece of cake. All of a sudden, the doc came back in and he said, I don't know, we got some issues here. Well, to make a long story short, I was fine. But uh, my heart rate was so low that he thought I might have had a heart problem and he just wanted to take some extra tests to make sure that everything was okay. And it was okay. And I'm still clicking. But, uh, you know, that got my attention. Marsha almost bailed out at that point, you know. Uh, but it got my attention that, you know, was there something wrong? I didn't see it. I didn't feel it. But could there have been something wrong? Certainly there could. Well, the Laodiceans are being told that they might feel well and think highly of themselves, but the great physician is concerned about them and concerned about their lukewarm hearts. And because he is, the great physician offers them a cure. Jesus invites the Laodiceans to find healing for their heart issues by coming 
to him. In Matthew 11, he said, come to me and I'll give you rest. In John 6, he said, he who comes to me will never hunger, will never thirst. Listen to what he says here in Revelation 3. I counsel you to buy from me. Those are the key three words. Buy from me. Gold. If you want to be really wealthy, come to me and I'll give you wealth that you might be rich. And white Buy from me white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and cover your nakedness. And buy from me salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. But the point is, Jesus is saying, you are poor and blind and naked and you need to come to buy from me by faith. Isaiah 55, come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come, buy and eat. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let him return to the Lord and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Jesus must be seen as the only trustworthy source of healing. Many are going to offer you alternative medications. But there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. And no one comes unto the Father but through Him. Jesus must be approached in a spirit of genuine repentance. He says in verse 19, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. He says, I'm going to point out the problem. So be zealous and repent. Turn from your self-reliance, turn from your self-confidence. The hymn writer says, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, look to thee for grace. Foul, I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. It's the echo of the publican who prayed, God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And Jesus must be embraced in genuine faith. He must be viewed as the only true source of help. He must be, uh, he, we must turn to him in repentance and we must embrace him by faith. And that's what I hear in verse 20 when he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Now the word faith is not in that verse. But that's what the verse is all about. Jesus, at the door of our hearts, if we hear his truth, hear his invitation, and open the door to trust, to receive, to believe, he will come in and eat with us and have fellowship with us. That's what faith is, receiving and resting upon Christ alone for our salvation. Confessing with our lips Jesus is Lord and believing in our hearts that God raised him from the dead. And those who come in repentance and faith are promised that they will know his mercy, taste his grace, and eventually see his face. Verse 21 says, The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I conquered and sat with down on my father's throne with him. My guess is that Many of you have a cardiologist or you've met one, right? You may know one all too well. Many of us have had blood pressure issues, irregular heartbeats, clogged arteries, had to have valves replaced, perhaps even a transplant. But the undeniable truth is this, if the heart is struggling, the whole body is affected. You can't have a bad heart in a healthy body because the heart governs the body. That's why the writer of Proverbs says, guard your heart, for from it flow the issues of life. That's why the psalmist says, search me, O God, and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's why David prayed, create in me a clean heart, O God. Many years ago, I heard the story of a young boy who was going out for his local community football team and as part of that process they had to have their obligatory 
a medical checkup, and uh, as the boys came through, they were passed along, except for Jerry. Jerry was, was held aside because the doc wasn't convinced that, that he was ready. And after further examinations, it was revealed that Jerry did have a heart condition that required treatment and he had to go on a regular basis for examinations and x-rays to, to, to monitor the progress of his condition. And on one occasion, the nurse came out with, with a face that didn't look very pleasant, and she says, the x-rays are going to have to be retaken. And Jerry's mother got very concerned about it. She said, what's the problem? The nurse said, well... Jerry went for his x-ray and was wearing a big cross around his neck and we took the x-ray of his heart and, and we, we couldn't see the heart because there was this big cross <laughs> blocking the heart. And Jerry said, I want that x-ray because if anything is an expression of my life, that's it, a damaged heart covered by the cross of Christ. I wonder if your spiritual heart were x-rayed tonight, what would it look like? Could you be among those who had a false diagnosis? Would Maybe you came in here, you would have said, oh, everything's fine, I'm doing fine. Maybe, maybe after thinking about it, hearing this letter to the Laodiceans, you might think, well, I'm not so sure I'm doing fine. If your spiritual heart were x-rayed, would there be a cross covering it? Are you trusting your efforts and your performance or your goodness? Or, or are you trusting and resting in the finished work of Jesus? Never forget, man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. What does he see when he looks at yours? Father, we ask tonight that as we reflect upon the hidden part of us called the heart, the center of our beings, the central part of, of who we are and what we believe, that we would truly be devoted to you, that the great physician would not say, lukewarm, lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, but that we would be those that have repented of our self-reliance and self-confidence and truly trusted in the finished work of Jesus and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. Stir our hearts, we pray, our Father, that we might be zealous for you, that we might love you with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbor as ourself. Do that work within us so that there be no misdiagnosis that we truly might hear the Lord Jesus knocking. We would invite him in and have fellowship with him all the days of our life. For we pray this in his name. Amen. So let's conclude with singing these three stanzas of Rock of Ages. Look to thee for grace, thou 
so much for coming or for watching tonight and uh, receive the Lord's benediction as we depart. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you this night and forevermore. Amen.